welcome to Oberti Sullivan's very first podcast, uh, and actually video cast. Today's topic is uh, the top 10 mistakes that employers make and how they can avoid them. My name's Ed Sullivan. This is Mark Oberti. And we are both board certified lawyers here in Houston. And a few disclaimers before we begin. One, just to let you know, uh, we are board certified lawyers, but we aren't your lawyer. Uh, we're not giving you any legal advice. We're just giving you generalized uh, knowledge about the law and if you have any specific questions on your company or your own individual circumstance feel free to check us out at www.osattorneys.com or call us if you like and the presentation that we're doing today can be found on the website www.osattorneys.com forward slash presentations and it's all on the top 10 mistakes so uh, Mark, why don't you take us away with uh, whatever you want to do. This is our first one, so we're all a little new to this. Yeah, we've got a top 10 mistakes that employers make and how to avoid them. And, and actually, we're going to talk, I think, about three of them on today's podcast. And on subsequent podcasts or video podcasts, uh, we'll be covering, covering the remainder. Uh, and what we did to kind of conceptually let you understand how we put this together is Ed and I, between the two of us, have about 30 years, I believe, experience uh, in defending employers and in reading cases uh, under Title VII and the various anti-discrimination employment laws. And so we've kind of taken all that and looked at common themes where employers have been found liable, or either juries or judges uh, concluded that the employer had to pay in an employment case. And we identified those common themes and, and then we took the top 10 of those uh, and we broke them down and we're offering them up as teaching points for you uh, so that hopefully you can understand those mistakes that other employers have made and avoid them and avoid the lawsuits that come with them. And God forbid you do get hit with a lawsuit, at least hopefully if you don't make these mistakes, you won't find yourself on the losing end. Instead, it'll be very defensible. So the first uh, mistake that we notice is that, uh, or theme as Mark said, is when a company doesn't train their managers on the compliance of basic employment laws. This is real important as it comes up, and mainly it's important in the harassment context, but it's really just a good idea in general for them to know a little bit about the law. Uh, Mark, why don't you talk about some of this? Sure, this is kind of your basic blocking and tackling. And uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you don't train your people on complying with these laws, well, there's a good chance that they're not going to know how to comply. And frankly, as complex as the law laws are now, simply relying on you know common sense and good morals isn't going to get you there. And frankly, uh, the case books are filled with examples where an untrained manager, uh, maybe well intending, uh, violated the law. For example, it, it comes up frequently in pregnancy discrimination cases, comes up sometimes in hiring cases uh, dealing with uh, older workers where somebody might make an offhand comment about somebody's age and then bam, uh, you've got a lawsuit. So just more fundamentally than anything else, you know, training your managers on the fundamentals of employment law is likely to decrease the number of employment lawsuits that you have. And I think Mark and I both understand having represented companies for so long, we understand the problems that are associated with the training of managers. First of all, managers aren't there to be employment law experts. Managers are there for either you know manufacturing or selling or some other reason that they're actually hired for. But the fact is, is that if they're not familiar with the laws and how to deal with their employees, they can put the company on the hook for a lot of liability. Um, and you know there are there are, you know valuable lessons that can be learned by everybody just even in a short training, and even though nobody will think it's necessarily worth their uh, worth their while at the beginning, I think uh, at least if managers understand you know to, to make a simple analogy, red light conduct, yellow light conduct, and green light conduct, uh, it can be very beneficial. Uh, it also has dramatic legal consequences. For example, in a couple of, we're going to treat, keep it practical, but a couple of companion sexual harassment cases in 1998, uh, Ellerth and Farragher, the U.S. Supreme Court held, uh, if an employer takes as a general matter, uh, it has a mechanism in place to address harassing conduct, and they could show that a, an employee that was uh, allegedly harassed failed to take advantage of that mechanism unreasonably, well then that's an actual defense to an harassment claim, even if the person was harassed. And, and so in order to prove up that defense, you want to not just show you have a policy, 
but prohibiting sexual or other forms of harassment and providing a mechanism for a complaint, but you actually do training on that policy. And if you can show that the managers were trained and maybe the, even the employees were trained on how to utilize that policy, that's going to go a long way to establishing that defense. Then there's another case that was decided the next year, Kolstad, which is a big case that says uh, for punitive damages purposes, which of course is where the employer gets hit for can get hit for real large dollar damages, uh, if the employer can show that even though it did violate the law and there was discrimination or harassment against the law, if they can show that as a general matter, the company takes reasonable good faith efforts to comply with the anti-discrimination laws, then under this Kolstad case, they can't be held liable for punitive damages. And so you really want to be able to prove that you've trained your people because that goes a long way to establishing that Colstad defense, meaning even if the worst does happen and you lose a discrimination or harassment case, you get off for punitive damages. And then I think Ed will talk a little about, from a practical standpoint, what this sort of evidence does in court. Well, uh, just think about it from a jury perspective. When a manager will get up there on the stand uh, in a lawsuit that may be alleging discrimination, and if they have to admit that they never got training on any employment discrimination policies or anti-discrimination policies, that's a horrible fact that they have to admit. And a jury isn't going to like that one way or the other. In fact, companies are going to want jury uh, managers to be trained on that way. M more specifically and to the point, as Mark was talking about this case called Kolstad, there's going to be a jury question on that, whether or not the company took reasonable good faith efforts to comply with the law. And one of the factors that would be involved in that is whether or not managers were trained on the anti-discrimination laws. And so it'll be, you know, it'll be, it's one of those things that they simply have to do. And I'll tell you another thing, and Mark knows this very well himself, which is that there are a couple of statutes out there like the Family Medical Leave Act or the Fair Labor Standards Act, which provide that, in fact, the statutes worded officers or agents. Any manager really would be an agent. Uh, you know, uh, under some theories, that will say that those people can be individually liable for independent violations of the law. In other words, the plaintiff can sue the manager, they can sue the company, and nobody wants to get sued. Um, but if someone's going to get sued, you know, uh, you know, certainly a manager is going to be scared out of his or her mind when that happens. And it's not going to be a great witness one way or the other. And it's going to do real damage to a company's case in large measure because they have to deal with other lawyers and conflict issues and all the rest, um, which can become problematic to defend. And so, you know, the best way to sort of, you know, solve this issue one way or the other is to make sure your managers are trained. Yeah, and tell you what, if you're having trouble getting your managers and, you know, like Ed said, they've got so much else going on, but one good way to motivate them to, to recognize that this is important is to let them know, hey, there are these laws out there where courts have held, you could be held personally on the hook. They usually start getting pretty interested at that point. The other thing is, is when you're going to train the managers, make sure to have some sort of record. I mean, this is very critical because if they just say, well, I went to a training, but, you know, they can't really say when or where. Okay, I mean, that's fine, but wouldn't it be better to have an actual, you know, list or a training list, uh, you know, that a sign-up sheet where you can show, look, here are the people that actually attended the training at this specific time. Um, and if you have multiple training sessions, either semi-annually or annually or the whatnot, then you can see a record of the constant training that occurs in the topics, and I think that's always going to be a good idea. That's a great idea. I'm sure uh, most companies have training on safety and, and other matters that they value and are, are at the core of the company. And so to just throw in on top of that, add in uh, some sort of uh, employment law training or uh, compliance training with that, that kind of sets the whole, the whole right tone with any judge or jury to let it know this is part of the company's core culture. And Mark, why don't you talk about uh, mistake number two? Mistake number two, uh, not filing a report of injury or illness when it should be filed. You know, we do surveys on employment cases that go to trial and what percentage of the time the plaintiff or the defendant wins. And believe it or not, workers' comp retaliation, we all know it's against the law in Texas to fire somebody because they filed a workers' comp claim, and it's against the law in most states. Uh, that claim is the claim that seems to be the winner the most percentage of the time for the, for the employee and the highest average verdict of over a million dollars. And I think that's because uh, it tends to resonate with jurors, 
the jurors tend to think that perhaps there is some sort of motivation to retaliate against somebody who's uh, possibly cost the company uh, money by filing a workers' comp claim. And so, th for whatever reason, those claims seem to do well with jurors. And especially, especially when the company uh, refused to file or failed to file the first report of injury illness when it should have been filed, which under the law you're supposed to file. Uh, there's rules on it after you've, somebody's missed a full day of work because of the on-the-job injury. And, and believe me, you can understand from the opening statement for the plaintiff's lawyer emphasizing that when the company failed to do that, well, they'd let you know right from the start, would be their argument anyway, that they're hostile to these claims and they don't want these sort of claims and that's why they didn't file it even though they were supposed to and when the uh, employee had the audacity and the temerity or courage to file that claim so they could get covered for the injury that they suffered trying to serve their employer faithfully well then uh, the company in a, some sort of retaliatory rage terminated their employment and so uh, you definitely don't want to be subject uh, to that sort of argument so you always want to file that first report of injury illness when it should be filed it doesn't mean you can't contest a claim this is just a procedural thing you have to do and you know on on that point just just a sort of a little tangential issue here is it's it's not a good thing but it's not the end of the world if an employee gets hurt at the end of the job you should have established procedures you should follow osha and frankly you should be compassionate and nice and understanding when an employee gets injured on the job even when that might not be the most convenient thing uh, it may have been the employee's fault you can name your reason but uh, what from an employment law context what the company wants to establish is uh, they acted reasonably. In fact, they went above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, they, you know, they, they, they visited the person in the hospital room, or they sent flowers, or they called the spouse to make sure that the person was doing okay. Uh, any of those things demonstrate, you know, the exact opposite of any type of retaliatory behavior. One of the factors that the Texas Supreme Court says that the litigants and juries and judges are to look at in these workers' uh, comp retaliation cases are, what was the treatment of the employee by the employer? Were there negative comments made? Were, were was it, was it, uh, did, did some safety person say, you ruined our record? Or, you know, comments to that effect. And so you should be very careful when an employee gets injured on the job that at that moment, you are sitting at the epicenter of potential liability and how you act and behave is going to be remembered by that employee for one important reason. That's probably the last time, if it's a serious injury, that the employee is going to be at the facility for a long time. And that's what that employee is going to, that's going to be the takeaway memory. And it's going to be the very first thing the employee tells his spouse and a lawyer. And it's going to be one of the lead paragraphs in a lawsuit if it's done the wrong way. Yeah, and so uh, not to beat a dead horse, but, you know, don't turn off your human compassion chip uh, at the workplace. And we've had a couple of cases where the employer did, did the pitch perfect thing. Well, I remember one in East Texas where the employee actually got into a car accident driving the employer's vehicle. And it was his fault, at least the police said so. Uh, but notwithstanding that, a district manager who'd come in from out of town that day and other things going on, as soon as he heard that this person, this employee had been in an accident, even though it was his fault, drove to the hospital, was at his bedside and told him everything will be all right and showed that sort of timely compassion and care for the employee so that when regrettably uh, months later when the employee was terminated for wholly unrelated reasons but then term fi filed a lawsuit claiming workers comp retaliation that evidence that evidence just rang so strong and really we think carried the day for the company and so uh, you know th what Ed said is just directly on point don't forget that when you have that situation arrive Okay, so this has been our first two tips of the top 10 mistakes that employers make. Uh, we look forward to coming back to you with other podcasts and video podcasts talking about other mistakes, and we hope this works out, and we hope uh, you enjoyed our presentation. Thank you.